All right, so let me uh, tell you a little bit about our work. Oh, I, I guess to begin with, so as, as some of you may know, there's a lot of effort in Canada to sort of reconcile with Native people and how awful our government has historically been to Native people. So we now begin presentations by talking about um, uh, by talking about land acknowledgement. And so my land acknowledgement is simple. The, the research in my lab actually takes place on the land that is, or the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, uh, Luna Pewak, and Chinantan nations. Um, and actually, this is this is a picture of a, of a Haudenosaunee village, one of the biggest ones, I think, in North America, actually, in its day. Uh, that's in, It's found within present-day London, Ontario, where we live. And this is Part of the museum grounds is actually a wonderful place to go and walk. I enjoy it as a as a great place to go for for an outdoor outdoor experience. Um, I'm going to speak a lot about drugs today, but I have no conflicts of interest. I don't have shares in any company, or I'm not trying to develop any any chemical compounds for therapies based on what I'm talking about today. Okay, uh, so. So Lawrence gave a great introduction about me working on pocket proteins and RB and cell cycle. And I'll, and I'll tell you how that connects with this in a little bit, but probably the place to begin with, because I'm not gonna speak much about pocket proteins today, is to, is to begin by talking about tumor microenvironment and, and its importance in immunotherapy. And I don't wanna belabor details of it, um, but basically what I wanna, what I wanna say is, um, uh, there are a, a few different categories of tumor microenvironments. The inflamed environment from an immunotherapy perspective is the one that people want uh, because it has the high expression of the, the checkpoint proteins. So hence will likely be responsive to the drugs that block them. Whereas these, these contexts where if the immune system is excluded from the tumor microenvironment, or if it's called immunologically cold because it has a lot of immune suppressor cells and not a lot of effector cells, but this is likely to be a patient that won't respond well. And so there's a lot of research that's gone into the idea of how can we change these into this inflamed environment? Are there chemical treatments that will actually stimulate these cells to attract an immune response and become better candidates for treatment? And so this is where this idea of a viral mimicry has come in, is that you can basically treat uh, cells or you can treat people with drugs, um, and it will cause misexpression um, of endogenous viral sequences or repetitive elements that are encoded in the, in the genome of these cells. Um, they become expressed, they activate uh, pattern recognition receptors that sense them, they turn on a very specific transcriptional program, often leads to the activation of expression of interferons. And the interferons can recruit immune cells for a cytotoxic death. Uh, interferons also can have a cell autonomous effect on the cells that, that create them or in the microenvironment where they will induce a death response as well. And so this is sort of the basic idea is if you could chemically activate this kind of immune response, very specifically within cancer cells, this would give you the ability to create an inflammation event uh, that would potentially be something you could harvest, uh, you could benefit from in the perspective of treating patients. Okay, and so, so there are a few different pathways in which you can activate viral mimicry. Um, and by no means am I an expert on this. We've sort of stumbled upon this really by accident. Uh, so I see it as basically three categories, but there are probably more, and this is probably growing all the time. So the main way that people view activation of a viral mimicry response is to inhibit heterochromatin through the demethylation of DNA. So there are drug compounds that are involved in inhibiting histone, uh, DNA methyltransferases. This will lead to a loss of heterochromatin structure, increased expression of repeat transcripts. At some level, these likely form double-stranded RNA structures or some other structure that is recognized by pattern recognition receptors. In this case, it's usually RNA sensing, Rig I or MDA5 are the most common ones. And they would then turn on interferon response. I'm going to tell you about histone H3 lysine uh, 27 trimethylation. There's a, there's a lot less data here. Um, I think it's still early days, uh, but you can inhibit heterochromatin formation through inhibiting histone demethylases uh, or by inducing demethylation. Um, again, repeat transcripts will form secondary structures. This is, we, we think, um, there's some evidence that C gas, which is normally thought of as a DNA sensing enzyme, can respond to this and activate interferons. I'm a little bit confused about this. My lab has certainly 
has some unpublished data, we think that it maybe doesn't use sea gas. Um, so it's to me, it's I'm not clear that it has to be sea gas as a as a pattern recognition receptor, but it certainly does use a pattern recognition receptor. And the third example that's that's a little bit different is through inhibition of mRNA splicing. There's a fairly recent study that shows that if you block the processing of transcripts through inhibitors, that you can create some sort of a structure, whether it's double-stranded RNA or not, I don't know. It definitely uses reg -I and MDA5, so maybe there's reason to think it's double-stranded RNA. And this, in turn, also activates an interferon response. And so all of these are ways that you can create uh, a sort of viral mimicry activation event. Okay, so, so I told you I'm going to be interested in H3K27 trimethylation, which obligatorily gets me to telling you about EZH2. So EZH2 is an enzyme. It's the catalytic subunit of polycomb repressor complexes, which are very well known for roles in patterning and development. So it's a multi-protein complex. Um, EZH2 is the catalytic subunit. And it, it, it processively uh, or progressively methylates histone H3 at lysine 27 and creates these trimethylated structures on, on histone H3. And this is part of an organization to make heterochromatin um, that will involve regulating gene expression that's well known in development, hence the role in patterning, um, but also heterochromatin that forms at, at repetitive genome regions and can play a role in regulating uh, expression of repetitive elements as well. Okay, so that's sort of the basics of it. Um, in mammals, EZH2 is essential for the generation of B lineage cells, which is going to become important in my talk later. Most of what I'm going to tell you about is very B cell centric. So you need EZH2. If you knock it out early in development, it will block this lineage formation. Um, EZH2 through genomic studies was discovered uh, to be mutationally activated in a lot of B leukemias and lymphomas. Um, it can also be uh, transcriptionally overexpressed as well to have gain of function phenotypes. And so this has been the, the, the motivating uh, reason for creating anti-cancer cancer agents um, to counteract this activity. I think the expectation would be the B leukemias and lymphomas that actually activate it or overexpress it. Um, the first uh, candidate to mesostat uh, has been recently clinically approved. Actually, it's been given orphan drug designation and it's used for a very rare kind of cancer, an epithelioid sarcoma. Uh, so it's Tasveric is its, its uh, trade name um, and has metastat as the, the compound name. In, in my talk today, I'm going to use a, a preclinical compound called GSK343. Um, it's distributed and studied extensively by the Structural Genomics Consortium. Uh, as a chemical probe, it's, it's not a candidate to be used um, in, in patients. Although a GSK, among many other companies, also have their own candidate as an EZH2 inhibitor. So there's definitely a lot of interest in creating these and, and purposes for using these, are, I think, are yet to be completely worked out. Okay, so that's the background of EZH2. So then why am I interested in all of this? Because Lawrence told you I work on RB family proteins. And so a number of years ago, we made a mutant mouse uh, that had a really interesting phenotype. And, and the interesting phenotype was that it lost H3K27 trimethylation at, at heterochromatin locations that silence endogenous viral sequences and other repetitive sequences. So a lot of people, myself included, have, have worked on RB and its regulation of E2F and cell cycle genes. And, and if you work in Lawrence's lab, you're probably very well familiar with the idea that E7 can disrupt this regulation and, and activate E2Fs. And this is part of why we think that uh, E7 is an oncogene. But separate from this paradigm that sort of RB gets phosphorylated and turned on, turned off every cell cycle, what we discovered was there was a complex that contained RB, it contained EZH2, that was relatively immune to cell cycle effects. So this function worked whether a cell was proliferating or not. So it didn't depend on, on phosphoregulation. And EZH2 would direct trimethylation at, at these largely repetitive sequences. <clears throat> and this was interesting to us because the mice get cancer. So this we call this mutation that disrupts this complex, but not that complex. Uh, we called it RBS. It's, it's a single point mutation, but the details of it aren't, aren't critical here. Um, it lives uh, a, a rather medium life expectancy, and they almost all die of a, of a B lymphoma. Uh, it's usually a splenic, splenic site of lymphoma, but can often be the mesenteric lymph node as well. 
Um, and so this got us interested in B cells and it got us interested in trying to understand the biology of regulating repeats and, and how this is important uh, in, in cancer and also in, in sort of normal animal physiology. And so I'll give you an example of a, of a problem that we were sort of left with. This paper was published uh, um, and quite a few years ago now, but there, it left us with a conundrum because it was a really difficult model to study. And so this is an example of some of the data that came, that came from these mutant mice. It was a very enigmatic phenotype, this sort of misexpression of repeat. So this is just heat maps showing the warm color is the expression. Uh, these are three repeat classes, major satellites, line one elements, and IAPs are an are in endogenous retrovirus. And basically, if we did PCR to look for expression of repeats, and you know, remember the dogma is that you silence repeats because they're bad, and if they get misregulated in expression, they can cause damage to the host genome. We would find, you know, maybe half the mice would actually misexpress repeat. The other half would look kind of normal. We would find in, in the wild type cohort, um, in comparison, that we could find one that would look just like a mutant, um, but then there'd be more that would look, you know, kind of more tranquil with less expression. And so it was really difficult to understand how to study this, given that it happens in wild type cells too. It just seems to happen more often in the mutant. Um, it was very specific to the spleen. It was very specific to, to B cells. Uh, this is an example of data from the liver as an example, as a comparator that it was much less expression uh, and fairly similar across, across the different cohorts. And we would also find examples of inflammation. We'd find really this, this uh, heat map probably doesn't do this justice. The interferon expression can be very high in some of these mutant mice. Sometimes it was the same mouse that misexpressed, but sometimes it wasn't. Um, and it gave us this idea that maybe sometimes these cells misexpress repeats and it activates inflammation, and that maybe there's a culling of these cells and then the cell and then the mice re re restore themselves to sort of a baseline level and it starts all over again. And this is another example of kind of enigmatic data that came out of this. This one's actually unpublished. Um, if, we, if we isolate spleens and, and, and isolate the cells within them, separate B cells and, and the sort of non uh, B cells, the CD43 positive fraction. Uh, and then look at the expression of really the same components and, and interferons, I guess, as well, um, that you could find uh, expression of repeats at really high levels, um, specifically in these mutant B cells. But again, you could also find it sometimes in a control cell. You never found it in the other cell fraction. And the magnitudes were, were just bizarre. I mean, 8,000 fold activation compared to others that don't even activate at all. And so we were really left with this question of how do we work on this? How do we study it if it, if it happens so dramatically different from case to case to case and, and isn't always perfectly reproducible? And so this got us into the idea of, of trying to set up experiments to, to understand whether the immune system is somehow uh, creating an inflamed environment that will eliminate these cells that we're trying to study. And so there's really a cycle of production of, of, of repeats and then culling of those cells. And so this is where we got into this idea is, is whether or not EZH2 can create a, an, an endogenous viral mimicry, not a, not a cancer cell induced, but if, if, a, if a normal cell is actually capable of this, and if there's actually self-recognition by the immune system as a response to that, which seemed kind of surprising that your own immune system would, would kill itself. Um, and so this, is, so this is the question we asked, and this is where we started. So again, beginning with this self-fractionation, so we use this this MAC system, and, and I'll show experiments with this again and again and again today. Um, lice, lice erythrocytes, and then separate B cells by using magnetic beads to deplete out the CD43 positive cells. By flow for us, this leaves a 95% or better uh, purity of B cells um, using a B cell marker like CD19 or CD20. And then it leaves behind these CD43 positive splenocytes. So if we drug treat these um, with uh, an EZH2 inhibitor, thinking we could do the same thing that our RB mutant does. It does what we would expect, and it, and it diminishes um, HVK27 trimethylation in, in the course of this experiment. Interestingly, by comparison, the other splenocytes don't seem to, the other splenocytes have much lower levels of HVK27 to begin with, and they really don't demethylate them in the time that we do these experiments. 
Okay, so there's something special about B cells that they that they do respond to this. Um, <clears throat> if we uh, if we inject mice with with EZH2 inhibitors, it kills resting B cells, or the resting I should say the resting B cells die. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of, of of data items from an experiment we did. If we would look at mice most, mostly at two days, which I'll show you throughout today's talk, and then even if we go as far as five days of treatment. Um, by two days, it's quite readily evident that there is some disruption of, of the follicles um, in the spleen and that there's sort of a pockmarked appearance. At higher magnification, there are dying cells and there are macrophages engulfing those dying cells. And there's evidence of, of, of apoptosis. The quantities of B cells drop by about 50% in the course of these two days. If we do this experiment for five days, which is actually a little bit toxic for the mice, um, it almost decimates the follicles and there's a lot of acellular material. So it really has a dramatic effect in, in killing these B cells. So this, um, and, and so if we look at B cells in these scenarios, we actually also see uh, misexpression of repeats. If we look at by RNA-seq, if we look at total splenocytes, it doesn't really look very impressive. Um, if we isolate B cells, there, it's quite clear that a, that a host of different types of repeats become expressed. Um, again, if we, we double check this by PCR, interestingly, the CD43 uh, positive splenocytes, uh, so these are the non-B cells, actually reduce repeat expression. There's some basal level that goes down kind of consistently. And then the repeat elements very specifically go up in the B cells, which is why it likely looks like it's sort of subtracted effect. Some cells diminish expression, some cells increase expression in, in this population. So it doesn't look like anything's changed, but B cells really have a really strong activity in this, in misexpressing repeats. In, in, in some ways, similar to these RB mutants that we had in the past, but, but couldn't really see a consistent res result. Okay, so this, so this kind of leaves us with, with kind of two questions. It, it could be that there's loss of H and K27 and this leads to some sort of cell autonomous cell death effect. Um, that's, that's reasonable. I mean, it's, it's thought that this regulates important gene expression. Misregulated heterochromatin could probably have effects on genome stability as well. That could, that could cause a cell to die. The hypothesis that I do like better is, is the idea that, that defective repression actually causes this inflammatory response and that this pathway that I've led you through earlier is actually what's taking place, that there's some sort of misexpression and that leads to, leads to cell death. So in thinking about how to distinguish between these two models, we wanted to come up with a way to try to block the cell death effect that would allow us to tell the difference. And so the idea we came up with was that we didn't want to interfere with T cells or interferons or things downstream because there are lots of things that can activate them. We thought that if we, if we eliminated the pattern recognition receptors, these are the things that directly act on the misexpressed repeats, the, these viral, these RNA structures, that if we eliminated those, we could block the signaling event and it would allow us to tell the difference between something endogenous that's chromatin-based, that's really direct effect of the drug versus an indirect stimulation of an immune response. So this is, this is basically what we set about doing. And so um, we used, uh, all of these mice are actually available, have been knocked out previously by other investigators. Rather than obtain three different mouse lines and, and breed them all together to get a triple mutant, which if, if you're familiar with mouse genetics, will take quite a while. We actually used a, a CRISPR strategy to knock them all out simultaneously, all in the same mouse as a way of getting there quicker. So we basically injected mice with Cas9 mRNA, um, guides for each of the different, uh, different pattern recognition receptors, we inject zygotes, we create founders. Uh, if you're familiar with this method, um, the founders are almost always mosaic. So it's a different collection of, of mutations, some of which you'll see in the tail SNP biopsy and some of which will never get passed through the germline. And then we bred them, we basically bred founders together until we had triple mutants um, that were homozygous mutant for all three. And so this is just an example of, of knockout data. So this is looking at spleens, so if we look at rig I and C gas expression in the spleens of these mice, we call the mouse RIC for short because it knocks out rig I, IFIH1, and, and C gas, so R, I, and C. So the RIC mouse is missing rig I. It has a deletion of C gas. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that this is a defective mutation though. 
Um, MDA5 is not normally expressed. If you stimulate mice with poly-IC injection, um, then you'll see expression of, of MDA5. It's also missing in these RIC mice. If we test the function of CGAS, so CGAS is supposed to be able to bind to double-stranded DNA. Um, if we set up a pull-down using a biotin biotinylated double-stranded DNA probe, we can pull down CGAS. Um, it can actually bind to streptavidin as well, and so it likes the beads too, um, even, without, even without the probe. Um, and then uh, the RIC mutant uh, CGAS doesn't bind. There's plenty of input, it just doesn't bind. So this was our way of making triple knockout, triple knockout mice. Um, but it also forces you to do the experiment a little bit differently than maybe you would do. Normally in mouse genetics, you'd compare siblings that would be knocked out in control genotypes. And this strategy doesn't do that. And so there are a couple of controls that I wanna tell you about. So if you're, if you're interested in mouse genetics, these are important controls. If you're not, I promise you this, I'll get through the slide rather quickly. So there's the basic way that we did this was we intercrossed mosaic founders. Um, and this created three F1 mice that are essentially the genesis of all the mice in all of our experiments. And so they're aptly or romantically named 601, 2, and, and 4. Um, and we bred them all together to create every mouse that we use in our experiments. So the genetics of these three F1s are critical in understanding the mutant mice because Throughout this, I'm going to tell you they're triple mutant, but I'm not going to tell you I know the exact mutation in every single animal. So these three animals had one or two copies, either heterozygous or homozygous, of these different versions of IFIH1, Rig I, and C gas. Most of them are deletions that are an odd number of, of nucleotides, meaning it's going to create a frame shift and likely explains why there's nothing expressed. This deletion 18 is in frame, technically speaking, but we could never find expression of the protein with this mutation. CGAS was a bit surprising. It's two different 48 base pair deletions that are perfectly in frame, uh, which explains why you see that smaller protein because it deletes a little piece of it. But a critical piece that you actually need to bind and function in, in, its, in, its, in its role. So these are all disrupted alleles. The other concern in this strategy is, is that since we're inbreeding, and then I'm going to use basically a black six mouse as a wild type control. Any unwanted mutation that took place here as well is also with us for forever. Uh, and so we also looked at off-target mutation locations as well. So these, these two locations are sort of the two best, either within a gene or not within a gene locations that these guides were predicted to target. So bioinformatically, we picked guides in the beginning that we knew were very, very unlikely to have good target locations within other genes. So we never found a mutation in the highest scoring off-target in-gene location. This is the highest scoring intergenic location. Uh, in a couple of instances, we did find small deletions. So if you do the math, it's, it's basically six different locations, three different genes, two copies of each gene per mouse. Um, so out of those 36 possibilities, we only ever found two off-target mutations. So it was pretty good. Um, and so we felt confident that we could compare uh, what we call this RIC mutant with a wild type, just black six mouse that we obtained separately. Okay, and so if we take these RIC mutant mice and we isolate uh, B cells or splenocytes, um, or if we inject them, um, it, it shows a, an ability to block the death-inducing effects of GSK343. So this is, this is a, um, a viability assay looking at GSK343 with either purified B cells or total splenocytes. They have the same IC50. These are B cells that are either wild type or RIC mutant. They have the same IC50. So in a cell autonomous way, this drug is no more toxic to the RIC mutant than it is to the wild type. However, if you inject mice, um, and I showed you this kind of experiment before, you get this pockmarked the follicle and the spleen, and you have these dead dying cells, that's protected in the RIC mutant. So there's something about the immune environment and the ability, I think, to induce an inflammatory response that's key for killing these cells in the mouse. Because in vitro, there's no cell autonomous death that's any different when you have this mutation, yet the mutation can block the cell death. Okay, so, so this is why I really like this option number one in my model. I think that defective repression really does cause an inflammatory response and it likely induces um, the killing of these resting B cells. 
So I'm, you know, 30 minutes in, what am I going to tell you about the rest of the time? I talked about this model. We've had this data for a long time. I talked about this model to colleagues who had lots of problems with it. Um, most of them pointed out to me that B cells don't make interferons. So how could this possibly work? Um, that it just, it just didn't make sense. And so it struck me that if we could understand this pathway and actually delineate how exactly it works in our scenario, we would understand in greater detail how it works and the model would be much more convincing. <clears throat> so this is basically what I want to tell you about with the rest of my talk is the model that, um, that people know about as, as a therapeutic in a cancer cell is actually not the pathway that, that these cells work through. And so that's part of, I think, the story as well. Okay, so we wanted to know, does these H2 inhibition remove heterochromatin from repeats by, by blocking this H3K27 trimethylation? And then does it also activate an inflammatory response gene expression programs? And so again, we use the same purification scheme to isolate B cells. Um, in some cases, I'm going to show you experiments where we use the splenocytes as a control. And then we set about doing chip sequence to look at uh, H3K27 trimethylation uh, throughout the genome, either in wild type black six mice or in the RIC mutants. And we also did a, an accompanying RNA sequence experiment, either in wild type or RIC mutants, again, plus and minus GSK343. Uh, okay, so, so this is an example. I've got a couple slides of, of, of chip sequence data. If, if you're used to this, it'll it'll seem simple. Uh, if you're not, I'll try to I'll try to go through this. But but e either way, in a couple slides, I'll get back to summarizing the model again, and you don't have to worry about the details of chip sequencing. But basically, these are heat maps that show read buildups, so locations where H3K27 trimethylation is located, and it breaks the genome down by little segments. Each of these segments in includes what we includes what we call a peak, which is a location where there's read buildup. Um, and then, and then the, the height of these columns contain very narrow lines that are these each of uh, the individual genome locations. So this is, you know, probably 40,000 genome locations all piled up on top of one another. And so basically what it shows you is that if we chip H3K27 trimethyl from wild type cells, that we can find it abundantly at a certain number of locations. If we do it in a second replicate, it looks almost identical. If we do it in cells that were GSK343 treated, which as we know, diminishes H3K27 trimethyl, then it's, dr it's dramatically lost at those two locations. Visually, you can see this is almost identical with this RIP mutant. So it, it has the same response to the drug. It, it demethylates these locations. If we break down the locations by genome category, are these promoters, are these distal or intragenic regions, Intergenic regions and introns are basically the places where repeats will hide. What was interesting from this was you'll see in this pie chart, the biggest pieces that diminish when we treat, so going from vehicle to GSK343, is this gray, gray uh, segment and this, and this orange segment, which is the distal intergenic and the introns. So basically the locations where repeats are found are actually the preferential loss locations. Shown another way, so just trying to look at peak loss, uh, this dotted line is kind of the average. Peak loss in promoters is relatively uh, inabundant, but the most abundant locations, again, are these introns and intergenic locations. So it's consistent with repeats being uh, exposed by loss of, of histomethylation. And, and we looked at this specifically as well by repeat category. So if we, if we look at, so again, this is our peaks whose sequence contains either a simple sequence repeat, a line or a sign element, LTRs or endogenous retroviruses. RNA means like tRNA or ribosomal RNA. So those aren't part of the category, but you can see abundant methylation of these repetitive elements and that's lost consistently when we do the treatment. Um, and, and you can see that it's basically abundant in both wild type and mutant to begin with. And this is, this is just basically genome location tracks. Um, there's read buildup here that you can see of a vehicle following GSK343. There's less read buildup. This is the sort of peak calling. You can see examples of peaks, and then the peak is missing in the mutants. Um, and the, it's and this is showing you the two different genotypes from these same locations. It basically looks the same. The repetitive elements that I'm showing you are the ones that we actually saw misexpressed in the original in the original RNA seq experiment I showed you at the very beginning of my talk. So. So it makes perfect sense that we're losing methylation at the locations that 
would cause misexpression of repeats. So, so far, if we have either a wild type or mutant cells and we treat them with drug, they all do the same thing. They all misexpress repeats. All the, so in theory, the signal to activate pattern recognition receptors is there in both cases. Um, if we look at the RNA-seq type data, uh, this is where things start to diverge a little bit. So when we do RNA-seq data on this and compare the drug treated with the vehicle treated, um, there's a big set of genes that are either, either upregulated or downregulated. In the RIC mutant, it's a lot of the same genes, but it's just a smaller list. There's a few things that are different, but I would categorize as mostly missing things. So we ended up looking for what are categories of genes that are missing in their regulation um, in, this, in this drug treatment. And so this is basically pathway analysis that shows you that. So there are a number of categories that, uh, so, so the dark bar is wild type, which means there's a high statistical confidence, which means that whatever the cytoplasmic trans translation category is, um, it's happening in, in wild type cells, but it's not happening in the mutant. We were really interested in this monocyte chemotaxis category that's very close to the top of our list. Um, and then by comparison, all of the interferon gene regulation down here, it doesn't happen in wild type or in the mutant. Um, so it sounds like interferon is not the category of activation we're looking for. And we became much more interested in, monocyte, in this monocyte hemotaxis. And so this is looking at some of the genes from that category. And, and the heat map is showing you the, the data from our actual gene expression changes. There are a few genes here specifically that are chemokines that we became really interested in. Um, I'll show you more data for CCL22, 3, and, and I think one of the others. And so we also looked at the ability of these cells to produce cytokines. Um, if you're a wild type cell and, and you get treated with GSK343, the, the highest concentration is the one that makes the most sense. Uh, the CCL3 activates, um, CCL22 activates, uh, by comparison, interferon beta never activates. Uh, in the RIC mutant, it's statistically significant, but actually goes down. Um, so it does not activate CCL3 and it does not activate CCL22. Uh, you can see the, the quantities of, of, of chemokine here are quite, quite high. The, the interferon levels are basically background. Uh, so you don't make interferons, you, you definitely make chemokines. Um, and this is a genotype specific, this is genotype specific effect. So we wondered how, how was it that you activated it? Uh, as I showed you, this interferon response of factor three or seven is usually the one that people talk about as being activating of, of interferons anyways. Um, we struggled to, this is, this, I have to apologize, this is not a good experiment, and, uh, but I need to show it as a way of explaining what we, what we tried to do next. We struggled to find expression of interferon three as an example. We did Western blots that could never really convince ourselves that any of these little smudgy bands were the right thing. The comparison I'm showing you in HeLa is human. So human to mouse, I mean, the antibody could just like human, human IRF3 and not mouse. So we didn't really know what to do because we couldn't find IRF3. We wanted to ask whether IRF3 gets translocated to the nucleus, but if we couldn't find it, we couldn't ask that question. We could easily find nf kappa vp 65 and we looked at its translocation. So this is a chromatin fractionation experiment rather than fractioning the cell by organelles. We're basically looking at what, what binds to chromatin. So in uh, B cells that are either GSK343 treated or, or vehicle control, you can see there's loading of P65. So it's consistent with this idea that, that chemical stimulation causes repeats, causes activation of the pattern recognition receptors and that you get this P65 translocation and, and, and binding to, to gene promoters. This does not take place in the RIC mutant, so there's a block there. So we think it's likely that, that nf kappa would be P65 has a role in this, uh, but at this point I can't rule out IRF3. I think uh, better data that, again, this is still kind of work in progress. Um, we've looked at trying to block this pathway, so um, since you need I, IKK beta to phosphorylate and degrade IK beta, uh, IKB here and activate this pathway, we obtain uh, conditional knockout mice um, in which we could delete this in B cells and we could test whether or not those B cells still had the ability to respond to GSK343. And so this is basically the experiment. We inducibly activate the deletion of, of I kappa beta 
Uh, we let the mice rest. Ironically, the way you do it is to stimulate inflammation, but we want to study inflammation. So we let them rest for a little while. And then we purify B cells out of them. If we test splenocytes by Western blot, the, the method works. The poly IC does delete this gene. Uh, the protein's missing. Uh, and then if we activate with GSK343 in, in purified cells, um, like I say, this is early days. We only have two, and the one activates really well, the other not so well. Uh, but it looks like there's probably a block um, if you're uh, if you're deleted, um, if you're deleted for IKK beta. So the idea being here that you need uh, P65 to activate chemokine expression. So whether IRF3 is there or not is maybe irrelevant. That it looks like P65 is, is probably essential for this mechanism. So not so not the interferon responsive pathway that others had, had talked about in in cancer cells. Okay, so so the pathway actually is a little bit different than perhaps um, what people had argued previously. In our case, it's not uh, it's it's not an IRF. It's NF kappa B. We don't think it's interferons. We never see them get activated, but we see other we see other uh, cytokines, specifically chemokines like CCL twenty two and, and and some others are activated. So it suggests that the pathway is there, but it's it's a different pathway maybe than than takes place in in cancer cells. Okay, so this so this got us thinking: is is this completely a chemically induced event, and that there's there's no actual signaling pathway that normally functions in a B cell to do this, and we've just sort of triggered some synthetic activity with a chemical, or is there really a a, a viral activation pathway in B cells? That, that we're just sort of rediscovering. And I think the answer is we're rediscovering a pathway. So uh, we couldn't help but notice that EBV infection of B cells looks an awful lot like a GSK343 treatment. So if you take uh, RNA sequence data from EBV infected B cells, human B cells, and take it through the same pattern, uh, gene expression patterns, uh, monocyte hemotaxis is again, one of the top categories. So clearly viral infection of B cell does this. Um, also, if you look at gene expression of specific um, chemokines like CCL22 and CCL3, I showed you these were the ones that were up in the, up in the wild type. They're not activated in the RIC mutant, but EBV infection, again, this is human data. Um, so, it's, so it's not a, it's EBV is the, is the treatment of the vehicle. Um, in that case, you get activation of the same thing. So it really looks a lot like an EBV infection and the response that a B cell would have. So I actually really like calling this viral mimicry because it truly is the chemical mimicking a viral infection. Okay, and so then sort of last pieces of data, um, I, I sort of showed you this already, that the Rick mutants, um, if we inject those mice with GSK343 and we, we look at their spleens, that there's a block in, in B cell death. Um, we've also looked at characterizing at least some aspects of the immune system in response to this. So in this case, if we, if we vehicle treat, normally you'd see a loss of B cell numbers in the spleens. This is largely blocked, but not completely blocked uh, by the RIC mutant. Um, we see recruitment of T cells. Uh, recruitment of T cells is not blocked. Uh, it, it's maybe a bit reduced, but it's not completely blocked. Uh, there is a, a, a pretty firm block on CD8 positive B, uh, T cells, but the CD3s uh, means that there are other T cells in the, in the uh, immune environment. Neutrophil recruitment also takes place in response to, uh, um, to GSK343, and this seems to be blocked in the Rick mutant as well. So it looks like when you can't induce this inflammatory response, that there's a, there's a, a, a big change in the immune uh, response that takes place uh, in the spleen at the same time. Okay, and so basically to summarize, um, I think we've stumbled upon what I would call a, a different example of a viral mimicry, one that actually takes place in an endogenous cell, not something that's cancer cell specific, um, where GSK343 can induce uh, the loss of HUK27 trimethyl. There's repeat expression. It uses these uh, pattern recognition receptors to activate nf kappa B activates chemokines, they can recruit neutrophils and cytotoxic T cells. And then our proposal is that that would be the main mechanism of recognizing B cells to induce cell death. I think this has a, a lot of considerations for use of these inhibitors now that they're in 
uh, actually approved for use in the clinic. Um, they were really originally, I, I, the motivation was to counteract overexpression or mutational activation. But I think our study says that, that these can work quite well on endogenous levels of EZH2. And so the idea that it's a, a therapy that can only be used when you have activated EZH2 as a targeted agent, I actually think when you're talking about B cells, it could probably kill a lot of B cells. So maybe some B cell leukemias or lymphomas um, could benefit from EZH2 even if it's not overexpressed or activated. Um, there are some interesting uh, papers about EZH2 inhibitor use in mouse models of autoimmunity and it actually having a benefit. And so I, I, I find these interesting. I don't completely understand them. Uh, there's a really interesting mouse model of lupus. Uh, and then there's a whole series of arguments in the literature from, from authors of these studies. And the real the controversy is that EZH2 isn't overexpressed. So how is it that this works? Uh, and so I think that perhaps there's, there's some explanation here that you're actually reducing uh, numbers of, of immune cells uh, through this kind of mechanism that we've stumbled upon. Um, I also think there's a little bit of a word of caution here that EZH2 inhibitors, you know, whether if you're using them as a cancer chemotherapy for something that, that's, not a, that's not a leukemia or lymphoma, you know, you're assuming it has no effect elsewhere in, in the patient's body, but I think it is gonna, going to affect their B cells. Um, and so I will stop there. Uh, almost all of this work, as you would have seen from the, the, little, the little label at the bottom right, almost all of it was done by a really terrific uh, PhD student, June Kim, who recently defended his, his thesis. He had help in a couple of instances along the way. Lindsay's our, uh, our technician who does uh, uh, gene targeting services. So she helped with making the mice. Rod Decoder's a, a B cell biologist who helped us with a lot of the methodology. Patty's our, um, our vet uh, pathologist that helps us with the pathology and, and Sam Asfahaz lab has given us the nf cap of BE uh, knockout mice. And so I'd like to, Stop here and thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions.